Director and Executive Director of Wyoming Stargazing. Here, you can pick the brains of astrophysicists, get advice from an aerospace doctor, learn about what scientists have to say about life, and find out what's going on up above your head all in the same place. So, thank you for joining us tonight, and we hope you join us every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 6 p.m. Mountain Time on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. Uh, on tonight's show, uh, we have our special guest, um, Dr. Deanna Shields from the University of Arkansas. Uh, among other things, uh, Dr. Shields studies the spiral arms of galaxies, and we will hear all about that later this evening. Uh, but before we introduce our special guest, let's welcome our co-stars. First, uh, author and journalist, creator of the Space Tourism Guide, it's Valerie Steinmeck. Hi, thanks for having me. Great to have you back, Valerie. Good to see you. Next, astronomer and data visualization engineer at the Adler Planetarium, it's Dr. Lauren Corleys. Hi, everyone. Hey, Lauren. Good to have you with us. Yeah. And uh, we might get uh, Dr. Danny uh, later on this evening. We will see if she joins us. Um, but uh, for now, let's uh, let's welcome our special guest, Dr. Deanna Shields. Hi. Hello. Thank you Hello. so much for making the time to join us this evening. Of course. So uh, welcome everybody. It's 2023. And uh, we're going to do things a little bit differently uh, in the Astro Show this year. Uh, you may have already seen that we have our special guest on already. Uh, we're not going to deprive you of all of that time with the special guest until the end of the show. Uh, now you get to interact with our special guest throughout the entire show. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Shields, uh, thank you for being our first special guest to endure the entire show with us. Um, hope you enjoy it. <laughs> I bet I will. Thank you for having me. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I thought since it's it's 2023 and we haven't actually like gone over like who we all are and what we all do for a while, that it might be fun to take a few minutes at the beginning of the show just to tell our audience a little bit more about us. Uh, so, so I can start and then we can do some um, some brief introductions and then we'll uh, we'll get started with the rest of the show. So uh, if you don't already know me, uh, I'm Dr. Sam. Uh, originally from the West Coast uh, in California, uh, went to Hampshire College to study physics and astronomy out on the East Coast and uh, somehow ended up in Wyoming. Uh, and I love it here. Been in Jackson for about 15 years and started Wyoming stargazing as a way to share my passion uh, about teaching people about the night sky with as many folks as I could. So uh, yeah, it's a pleasure being part of the organization for the past 10 years, believe it or not. We're going to have our 10th anniversary in July, which is super exciting. And uh, as I was just telling uh, our special guest before we got on live, uh, the Astro Show is definitely my favorite part of the job. So I am psyched to be here with all of you this evening. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions or have any comments you want to make, you can chat those questions on um, uh, Twitch and, um, uh, let's say, Twitch and YouTube, and we will um, be able to see those comments. Um, so, yeah, we would love to hear from you. So, um, give us a ring. And uh, with that, uh, let's, uh, let's pass along to Valerie. Hi, thanks so much. Um, so, I have, gosh, where do I begin? I am a journalist now, a journalist and writer, but my background is actually in psychology and business. So proof to everyone out there that you are welcome and encouraged to follow your passions and end up where you will in your career. I live currently in what I'm calling continuously cloudy Cleveland. Uh, <laughs> moved here without realizing quite how cloudy it is and how rarely I get to see the stars, which is why I love coming on the show. I actually uh, started out first as a special guest many episodes ago talking about public astronomy outreach and astrotourism and have been back as a co-star to uh, test my skills at the pop quiz and just learn some incredible information about lots of different parts of astrophysics that I would never have found through the work that I do. So hopefully for those of you watching, you will also learn something about an area of this field that you are not expecting to. Thanks, Valerie. Lauren? 
Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lauren. Uh, I'm originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but I've lived pretty much all across the country at this point. Uh, I knew from a pretty early age that I really liked physics and astronomy and math and all of those sorts of things and sort of just followed that passion where it would take me, which wound up in a PhD program. So I was a professional astronomer for a few years before deciding that research just wasn't for me. There's a lot of really great things about doing research, but my favorite part of my job was actually talking with people about astronomy. And so I decided to make that my career instead. Um, so I've been doing astronomy education and outreach professionally for over four years now. Uh, first at the Rubin Observatory and now at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, where I live. Um, so it's been an unexpected path, but it was just the one that made me happiest. And so it's the one that I'm following. And I'm really happy to be here and be able to share all of this with you. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Lauren. And for all you professional astronomers out there, there's room for you here. You can come on over to the education side. You are welcome. We have a lot of fun. <laughs> Good luck to have you. <laughs> Always room for more astronomy educators here in Jackson. Come on down. Um, yeah, we're going to have a, a pretty awesome observatory and planetarium uh, in Jackson by the end of the year. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Uh, and uh, Dr. Shields, would you like to uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Deanna Shields. I uh, teach physics and astronomy at the University of Arkansas. I have deep roots here. I love the hills. My research is in the spiral arms of galaxies, how tightly wound they are. Uh, although, like Lauren, my first passion is teaching. Uh, that's really what my job description is. It's not a research position, it's a teaching position. And I, I love doing that. And what I try to bring to the classroom, um, we often do poetry at the beginning and uh, end of our uh, lectures. And it is a bit awkward if there's only 20 students, but if there's 300, we can get a real pep rally atmosphere. We can get a call and response atmosphere in there. Uh, and now if there's just 20, they just look at each other and look at me like, what, you want me to say something? No, no, I'm just going to go back to scroll. <laughs> well, we're, uh, we're excited to have you with us uh, on the show this evening. And, uh, you know, as we go through the different segments of the show, please, like, pipe in with all of your uh, your comments. And, um, and if you have questions about like, why we're doing what we're doing here on the Astro Show, Dr. Shields, like, feel free to ask that stuff as well. I will. I will. All Another right. thing, though, that I love, even though, um, uh, like you said, I think, Valerie, learning new stuff, when you're researching, you're only doing your one little niche. So being around people who are doing other stuff will keep you focused and sharp in areas that you might not otherwise learn. Yeah. Agreed. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get into the show. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Shields' work later on. Um, and we've got some fun stuff in uh, the uh, the news quiz that we'll get to. Um, but uh, let's begin uh, with Astro. Oh, sorry, there's the uh, welcome to you, uh, Deanna. Thanks for being here. <laughs> All right, now uh, let's get into uh, astro advice, uh, life advice from astronomers, astronauts, and other scientists. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll read the quotation and then um, uh, briefly introduce the, the four possibilities of who actually said this. And then the co-stars and our special guest will have a moment to vote for who they think is the correct quoter. So here's the quotation. Let us choose for ourselves our path in life. Very appropriate to what we've already been talking about. And let us strew that path with flowers. I, I love that. Uh, so uh, four possibilities um, for who said that are A, Marie Curie, the um, Polish and um, French uh, naturalized um, pioneering physicist and chemist. Uh, our chemist who um, really helped us understand the basis of radioactivity. B, Rosalind Franklin, the uh, uh, commonly unsung hero of discovering the double helix structure of DNA. Um, it was not Francis and Crick, it was actually Rosalind Franklin who made that initial discovery. C, 
Um, Julie Payette, a Canadian engineer, astronaut, and the former Governor General of Canada. And D, Emily de Chatelet, a French natural philosopher and a mathematician, uh, circa uh, 1740s, um, I believe. Um, she did the, the very first French translation of um of newton's uh work and so it was the first uh, first translation of um uh of his uh physics so um those are the four possibilities co-stars special guest what do you think this one's tough <laughs> uh, this would be an absolute guess but Julie Payette, you said she was a, an astronaut and a comedian and Governor General of Canada. That seems like a whole lot of different stuff. Like someone who would absolutely pave their own way. I like the rationale. That's fantastic. So one one vote for uh, Julie Payette. Um, I was going to pick D, Emily du Chatelet, just because feels maybe like a little bit old timey language. I don't know. Ah, nice rationale as well. I like yeah. that. Hey, one, <laughs> one vote for Emily. Yeah, I had the same thought that uh, it seemed like more flowery language, not to make a pun of the quote itself. But um, <laughs> just because I like to keep things interesting, I will go with B, Rosalind Franklin. Okay. Well, uh, your gut was correct, Valerie. Sorry. <laughs> and Lauren. Uh, it was indeed Emily um, de Chapelet. And yeah, I had never heard of her before, but she did some really incredible stuff. Um, she was involved in some really early debates um, about the, the proper way of um, understanding um, uh, energy and talking about um, energy transformations. So yeah, um, did some derivations of Newton's work. And this was like long before women really had an in in the sciences. So she was she was crushing it um, 300 years ago. Um, so very, very cool stuff. And uh, now that we've um, established that she is indeed the quoteur, I'm, I'm curious about what the three of you just think of this quotation. Um, I want to chime in first and comment on how radical her portrait is. I have a feeling it was probably a really big deal that she wanted to be painted with elements of her scientific work as a woman, right? because women were not posed that way in portraits historically. Yeah. Yeah. It is super cool. It's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's like staring right at you too, which is also just like, it's like a challenge, right? Just from the portrait. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I really like this quote. I think it's, I wouldn't have come up with these words on my own, but I feel like I, they really resonate with me. It's even just from my intro, sort of what I was saying, just people have different expectations and just defining for yourself what you want. And hopefully it's fun along the way. And so, or beautiful, I think is maybe what she's implying with the flowers. Yeah. And that's the part that really struck me about it. Like, I think we've talked a lot about like choosing your own path and yeah. like, you know, not being confined to whatever space that like somebody else wants you put to put you in. Like that's been a recurring theme on the Astro Show. But the second part I think is not something maybe we've addressed yet, which is that the path should be fun. <laughs> and if right. it's not, Make your own beauty. Yeah, yeah, and and beautiful. And if it's not, then maybe there's something wrong, right? Right. Create something along the way. Create something beautiful in whatever it is that you're doing with your life. Be yeah. And also to leave it better for those who will come behind you. I think that's a very modern, mm -hmm. relevant sentiment we could all do with reminding of as, you know, general natural hostility has risen in the past few years that uh, strewing our path with flowers, if everybody did that, the world would be a much more enjoyable place at times. Oh, that's that's flowers interesting. everywhere. Yeah, there's an interesting take on that, Valerie. I, I kind of assumed that she was like in this quotation, like strewing the path ahead of her with flowers. But but you're thinking that maybe she's like strewing the path behind her with flowers as well, which is lovely. Yeah, I really like that. 
you will know her by the flowers strewn behind her. You can always find her. Yeah, uh, you know, the, the, the visual that just came to mind is uh, the the one of the characters in the movie Fern Gully. That's what I was just thinking. <laughs> Do you remember that? Like the... Mm -hmm. So like the like the, the 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 heroine of the story eventually becomes like the spiritual leader and like wherever she like walks flowers bloom behind her that's a that's a, like a lovely legacy to leave behind right every everything you touch turns to flowers as opposed to like gold <laughs> i would prefer flowers for myself actually <laughs> cool uh any other thoughts on this quotation Flowers are also more temporary than gold. Hmm. Like, it's... I'm, I'm not sure if that's what she was thinking about, but it's certainly... Maybe she's saying your life does not have to affect the world indefinitely. You know, just for the people who knew you, or, I mean, in her case, clearly for centuries, but... That's not going to be the case for all of us, right? Most of us are going to leave beauty or terrible things, whatever, depending on what we do, to the people who love us and the people that we leave behind. But it's going to be temporary either way, unless we make some huge mark on history, which a few folks like she will do. The rest of us will just, you know, rot like flowers. <laughs> But that rotting flowers become compost, so it's not so bad. Right. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm also feeling this connection with flowers because I think of them as a kind of a, a feminine kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And so also bringing more of like femininity into these spaces, particularly more you know male dominated spaces is I think something I'm always trying to do, even if I wouldn't have said that. And so bringing flowers in particular, is a really beautiful way to think about it. Yeah, thank you for that, Lauren. I, I agree. Um, it's, you know, it, it shouldn't seem like a juxtaposition, but it, it does, right? Because of like the status quo, but like there should be tons of beauty in science. There really is, um, you know, when you begin to understand it and, um, you know, we can, we can create that as educators as well. All right. That is something we can do as, as educators is show people the beauty of science, which is pretty easy to do with astronomy. I mean, people are kind of mind blown anyway, understandably, to look up. And, and we, can, we can really resonate with that. We can strike that chord and say, yes, yes, that absolutely is beautiful. Here are the details. Yeah. Yeah, astronomy lends itself to that. As do the other sciences, but but especially astronomy. It's definitely what hooked me in early on. Uh, all right. Well, well, thank you all so much for your uh, your comments on this quotation, and uh, thank you, Emily Duchelet. Um, it has been uh, it's been a pleasure thinking about what you were thinking about 300 years ago. So uh, it is now time for our uh, next segment, Astro 365, this day in astrophysics history. So on this day in 1946, uh, the US Army uh, received the first reflected radar signals that were bounced off the moon uh, as part of um, Project um, Diana. Um, I, I have no idea this was a thing, but after World War II, there was, um, there was a big push to um, develop um, radio and um, and radar technology, and this was really the beginning of radar astronomy. And I, I have to admit that I had never heard of the term radar astronomy before. Um, of course, I had heard of radio astronomy, um, but this is something different. Um, this is this is not uh, listening for radio emissions um, from stars or other um, cosmic events. This is actually deliberately bouncing um, radio waves off of objects to learn about their structure um, from the reflection of the waves. Um, and it has all kinds of applications in um, solar system astronomy, which is really, really cool. And 
I mean, I've been in astronomy a long time, and I don't know how I <laughs> had overlooked this or never been. I don't remember being taught about this in school. Um, I'm, I'm curious if, if Lauren, if you remember being taught about this or uh, uh, Dr. Shields. I don't think so. I think it's like there's this interesting, like historical distinction between astronomy and planetary science. And I feel like if it's more used more there, then it's not really something I would have learned about. And so, but that's neat. Yeah, it's super cool. Um, apparently, it's still used today. It was it was actually one of the techniques used to um, confirm the general theory of relativity, um, <laughs> bouncing um, radio waves off of mercury. Um, it's also been used to um, refine measurements of an astronomical unit, the distance between the sun and the earth. Yeah, there is a, a section in our introductory astronomy class where they, uh, in, our, in the book, where they talk about um, bouncing radar off of planets to get a very precise distance to them. Yeah. And I don't know the details about it, right? I, I, I say what's in the book because it's not my field, but uh, it's the same idea. I think that's how they do the AU, right? They, they send, they bounce radar off Mercury, Venus, Mars, the moons of Jupiter, the rings of Saturn, and they can very carefully then trace out those orbits and then put the sun at one focus. You can't bounce radar off the sun, but you can bounce it off everything else in the solar system, everything with a solid surface. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's super cool, and I mean, it's like it's it's pretty basic as well, right? Like, we've all heard like echoes off of canyon walls, right? I mean, like that's exactly what astronomers are doing with these techniques. They're basically just like look, listening for radio wave echoes as opposed to um, signals, you know, that our ear um, picks up. It's, it's generating the signal. That's the hard part, though, right? Like you need it to be strong enough and coherent enough to make it that far. Yes, so. and, and that's why 1946 was the very yeah. first time that this has happened. And apparently, it's it's been you know refined dramatically with increased technology and um, stronger transceivers and uh, you know um, and and receiving um, devices as well. Because I'm a, a multitasker, I was just looking this up, and it turns out that Arecibo had a radar astronomy component to the research they were doing there. Huh. And there's only one main facility left that's doing regular radar astronomy that it's out in California. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Where in uh, where in California did it say? It says, um, hang on a sec, uh, Goldstone Solar System Radar. So the Goldstone facility. Huh. Very cool. Um, I'm going to have to look them up. I've got a couple more months out there before I relocate back to Wyoming full time. So I will uh, go check that facility out. Looks like Southern California. Nice. Well, as soon as the rains stop, I will travel down the coast. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, it is time for the astronomy news quiz. Uh, we're going to do things a little bit differently uh, than we have in the past. This is all lightning round questions, so anybody can answer these questions. We're not going to assign them to, to any co-star, so no pressure here. But uh, but the whole idea is to, like, get, get these quick, all right? We need a buzzer. <laughs> no, and, like, we couldn't figure out how to get that going on uh, StreamYard. There must be a way to do it. Maybe yeah. we just don't have, like, the, the high enough tier to count mm. if buzzer sounds. Uh, <laughs> but I think uh, Maggie's got some... Uh, some cool uh, correct and incorrect stuff uh, to throw up on the screen if you're if you're correct or incorrect depending on uh, the question. Cool. Uh, all right. Well, are are the three of you ready for this? Yes. All right. <laughs> Here we go. Question number one: True global cell phone coverage may soon be a reality thanks to a recently announced partnership between uh, Iridium, a satellite communications company and blank, a wireless communications corporation. Oh, We're looking for the name of the wireless communications corporation that may be giving true global cell phone coverage. I thought I knew this one, but I don't think I know this one. <laughs> Ooh, we stumped you right out of the gate. Yeah, right out of the gate. All right. Uh, no, no, uh, this is giving me big Jeopardy vibes, and so I'm probably going to start answering the question <laughs> if I just forget. <laughs> I mean, is this one that we would see a commercial for? 
No, I, I hadn't heard of them um, actually before I, um, I looked them up. Hmm. Yeah, uh, it is a uh, Qualcomm. That's the name of this company that's apparently going to provide global cell phone coverage um, working with Iridium. Awesome. Qualcomm. Connect the world, get everybody online. Not because I'm like pro-capitalism, but because access to information is the most powerful part of the internet. And it's really cool to see parts that don't have access, get access. Totally. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, question number two. Uh, this country's first Mars rover is causing concern among scientists as it failed to wake up from a planned hibernation period. That's so, China? Uh, China! One point for Dr. Shields. Nicely done. Indeed. And uh, e extra bonus point if anybody knows the name of the rover. I didn't either. <laughs> and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation because I do not speak Chinese. Zhurong, um, maybe something similar to that. Um, but yeah, uh, has not come out of hibernation. So hopefully it does. Um, but we won't know until it happens. Okay, next question. Uh, a Virgin Orbit's launch on this country's soil failed yesterday after uh, it failed to reach orbit. Uh, causing Virgin Orbit's stock to plummet. So, Valerie. It's the UK. It is the UK. Nice. And there you go. That's a correct buzzer <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, we're not totally sure what happened, but it did not, did not make it up, unfortunately. Okay. We got uh, one point for Dr. Shields and one point for Valerie. Here we go. Next question. Uh, last week, uh, Raytheon announced that it had selected Blank uh, to build a missile tracking satellite for the U.S. Space Force. Who's going to be building this missile tracking satellite? Can I guess? Do it. Say Lockheed Martin. You got it. Nicely done. <laughs> they love building missiles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Lockheed Martin. The missile stuff. Yeah, and um, you know, we've, we've joked about Space Force before, but they, they are serious there. Um, so, yeah. All right, um, Dr. Shields in the lead with two points. Here we go. Uh, which airline announced its plans to offer free in-flight Wi-Fi next month, uh, putting pressure on other airlines to follow suit and driving up the demand for satellite capacity? Valerie. It's Delta. It's Delta. <laughs> and I'm bummed because I am flying Alaska tomorrow. So maybe by tomorrow, Alaska will jump on the man wagon. Um, <laughs> At least Alaska just charges a flat rate no matter how long the flight is. Uh, yeah, I do know that about the Delta Wi-Fi. It is. Yeah, it gets, like, you can get charged by the hour. You can get a subscription, though, for like the whole month. Uh, all right, uh, tied up two to two, nicely done. All right, uh, next question. Uh, SpaceX rang in the new year with the launch of blank rocket carrying over 110 small sats. Valerie? Is it the Falcon 9? It's the Falcon 9. I had a question like this before where you were like, it's the main one they use. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that one. Yeah, we're not we're not trying to trick you on any of these, I promise. All right. Valerie takes the lead. Next question. Uh, in order to mark the completion completion of the Tiangong space station, China issued gold and silver themed blank. Promise, not trying to trick you. You might have gold or silver. Rings? Not rings. Coins. Coins! <laughs> oh. My nice. brain was all over the place. I was like, t-shirts? <laughs> We're gonna, we try to keep it simple here. Uh, you're on board, Lauren, nicely done. Hey. Uh, well, you got the, you got the uh, astronomy quote, so. Uh, that's right, so you got two, that's right. <laughs> All right, here we go. Next question. 
Oh, oh there's there. one picture wow. of the coin. There pretty. you go. Yeah, yeah. they're pretty. Yeah, very nice design. Okay, a massive blank erupted yesterday at 11.50 a.m. Mountain Time, causing a temporary but significant radio blackout across South and Central America. Dr. Shields. Is that a solar flare? It was a solar flare. It was a big one, too. Um, lovely picture of it. Yeah, Class X flare. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I think that uh, brings Dr. Shields and Valerie tied again at three points each. Is that right? Did Valerie not have four? I thought Valerie had four. <laughs> I, think Valerie, not my that high to be sure. I think Valerie would have had four, but she she didn't. She she decided not to go with her gut with the um, with the astro advice. Maybe we should give that to you, Valerie, because you did think it was. Emily no, no. I, I chose to throw my hat in the ring on Rosalind Franklin. That's me. I stand by my answer. <laughs> okay, so uh, here is a potential uh, tiebreaker here. Um, the last question. Oh, match here. point. Yeah, match point. Here we go. Uh, new uh, James Webb Space Telescope, also known as Margaret Burbage Space Telescope, data, uh, provided astronomers with a view of an intruder galaxy, forcing its way into which group of five galaxies? A well-known group of five galaxies, and actually five is in the name. Think music. Isn't there one? It's Stefan's Quintet. Yes. Thank you. Hey. Nicely done. Hey. Wait, do we have a three-way tie with three points for each person? That is phenomenal. You are all <laughs> champions this week. Yay. Nicely done. Yay. Some feedback that was way less pressure. I really appreciate the new format. <laughs> okay, cool. We're gonna keep it this way then. From now on, it's just lightning round uh, astronomy news quiz. Um, yeah, I think I enjoyed that more too. Uh, and this is definitely one of my favorite um, interacting galaxies. Um, the um, the folks at James Webb and, oh, now I can't remember the branch at NASA, just did these really cool um, tactile prints um, of the uh, the James Webb um, Space Telescope image, our Margaret Burbage uh, Space Telescope image of um, Stefan's Quintet. And I should have grabbed it. We have it just uh, around the corner in the office here. Um, it's it's for the visually impaired to actually experience um, the images. Yeah, it's really, really cool. Um, so yeah, we have it on display at the office right now, but once the observatory gets built, we'll, um, we'll have it up there. Uh, all right. Um, well, that uh, concludes the astronomy news quiz. Um, we are up to what's up, Dr. Sam, and it's the comet. I don't know if you've uh, heard or maybe seen it yet. I haven't. We've had uh, cloudy weather the last few nights in Jackson. Um, it's just reached uh, perihelion. So it's about uh, one astronomical unit away from the sun, almost the same distance as Earth's like 1.1, I think. Um, but yeah, it's already up to uh, a visual magnitude of seven. So easily viewable in binoculars and um, expectations. Uh, so that's it way up at the top there, a tiny little green dot right now, um, but uh, it, just above the constellation of Corona Borealis. So it's up in the early morning sky. Uh, so you wanna get up just before um, sunrise to like three, four o'clock in the morning um, is a good time to see it. Um, but later in the month, um, it'll be getting higher in the sky. It's gonna be uh, cruising towards the north. And I think by the end of this month, it'll actually be by uh, Polaris, um, by the North Star. So due north um, later this month. And it's some projections have it as the brightest comet of 2023. I don't know how astronomers can say that because we're only in January. Um, but I guess they're expecting not to find any other good comets this year. Um, anyways, this is supposed to be a good one. Uh, not quite as good as Neowise uh, a couple of years ago, um, but it still could be a crowd pleaser uh, later this month. And so I think I got a little stress. Expect- oh, go ahead, Dr. Shields. Do they expect it will need um, binoculars or are they looking at naked eye? What are yeah, they- it, it could become um, visually... Um, uh, apparent with or without the use of binoculars later this month. We don't we don't totally know, um, but uh, for right now you need binoculars. But um, but as you can see in, in the chart down at the bottom, I, I know I have the chart upside down um, because I wanted to um, to have the, the traje- trajectory going up. Um, it's going to get um, farther and farther um, towards the zenith 
as the uh, the top of the sky as the month progresses. Um, so ending up by Polaris at the end of the month. Um, so yeah, um, check it out over the next couple of weeks. It could be um, quite a good show or not. <laughs> I've got to say we have had, I mean, I grew up, I, my first one of my first astronomy mem memories was Hale Bop, and then we went through this long spell without any comments of any note, and then it's just been like every year we get an incredible commentary experience. It's awesome. Yeah, I mean, what what is happening with that? Is it just total coincidence, or uh, maybe not? I do remember uh, Comet McNaught. Um, that would have been like two thousand six, maybe. That was a good one. I remember watching Comet McNaught um, right after sunset when I was um, finishing up my master's down in, in Laramie. We, we went up on the top of these um, railroad tracks and we could see it over the, um, the city just after sunset. I was in college busy not studying astronomy. <laughs> uh, you said as a coincidence, maybe not. Can you elaborate on that? What it might not be are you are you referring to like planet nine potentially throwing things at us i mean i was just kind of joking but sure yeah i mean maybe yeah maybe planet nine is throwing some stuff our way or or maybe something got jostled out in the kuiper belt or the Oort cloud that we haven't discovered yet something like that might be possible but who knows um well um, yeah, that's all I have for uh, what's up, Dr. Sam. Um, I hope you all get to see the comet over the next couple weeks. And uh, for the rest of the show, we, we want to spotlight our special guest because that's why she's here. Um, so, um, Deanna, again, thank you so much for uh, being here. Uh, in, in the past, the way we started off our conversations with uh, our special guests, um, when we used to just like bring them onto the show at this point, um, was to ask them, what's the one question that you wish everybody would ask you, but nobody ever does? Um, so let's start there and then we'll, we'll see where it goes. So um, you did warn me about this <laughs> question. And I have to say it terrified me because um, I generally don't like answering questions about myself. So the, the, the real answer is, I wish they would never ask me about it. <laughs> a part of it growing up, you know, as a, a queer kid in a very conservative town, I just, I developed a habit that it's that I'm trying really hard to break of, you know, keeping cards close to my chest. Um, but there is something that I wish uh, people did, and that is, why is Star Trek such a big part of your life hmm. and and the reason goes back to the same thing being a, a queer kid in uh growing up in a town that was culturally dominated by the Ku Klux Klan hmm. uh it was a very lonely experience hmm. but for an hour a week I was on a starship with people who valued science and didn't care what you did as long as you didn't hurt people I'm like, yeah, these are, these are my people right there. All right, let's, I'm going to go fly around with these guys. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I am a Trekkie, I think, originally for the same reason. I, I really love the, the social commentary and, like, the hopeful future that they share on that show. Yeah. I was actually thinking visionary. about that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was, I was saying it's visionary. Yeah, indeed. Real, real visionary. And, like... I was thinking about it, uh, I, was, I was on a drive the other day and I was thinking about like just the difference in like what Star Trek was all about and the title compared to Star Wars, right? right. Just like, at, at like the right. very base level, like the mm -hmm. title, like it's just a, such a different trajectory and an idea and intent from the beginning. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I've been a, a Trekkie forever, um, I think because of that. Mm -hmm. And, and we have to forgive them or look the other way when they get uh, science sometimes incredibly wrong. Sometimes right. Sometimes they actually talk to scientists, I think. And sometimes they're like, yeah, we don't have the budget to talk to scientists, even though, you know, we'll, we'll do it for pretty much free. Sometimes we'll do it for free. Please, please ask us about the astrophysics. <laughs> we'll tell you. Please, Hollywood. <laughs> so was it... Was it we have astronomers with email addresses. <laughs> 
Well, so was it was it Star Trek that got you into studying astronomy, or or the other pieces that that came together to get you on that path? Uh, I've loved astronomy since I was a very young child, and I think Star Trek fed into that. But uh, my favorite gifts as a kid were, were occasionally my dad would find a, a picture book or a, yeah, it's more a word book with uh, about astronomy. And I remember when I was young, the Voyager probes had just sent their data back and sent these beautiful pictures of Uranus and Neptune for the very first time, and really for the only time. I mean, we don't have up close pictures since the Voyagers of, of those two planets. Uh, although James Webb has a really awesome one of Neptune in, yes. <laughs> in, in the infrared. Uh, but I remember just staring at that and being like, hey, I want to go there. <laughs> can we go? Mom, can we go to Neptune? <laughs> Maybe someday. Next year. <laughs> um, get our vacation budget down. <laughs> that's super cool. I um, I mean, I also I remember, yeah, the Voyager images, um, yeah, as a young kid. And I, I watched a... Uh, um, a documentary about Voyager oh, just a few years ago. And it was so cool to like hear all these stories from the people who've been like working on Voyager their entire career, mm -hmm. right? For like 40 years, not hey. Voyager. And they're still going. Yeah, and they're still going. Mm -hmm. um, I guess not dissimilar from the folks who worked on James Webb for, you know, 30 some years. Yeah, right. And they finally, they finally got it up. There was, okay, a very heartbreaking scene in Star Trek V, the one we don't talk about, where um, an, an alien ship, the Klingons, just blow up a Voyager probe for fun. And I felt like that it just broke my heart to see him do that. I know it's fiction, but I'm like, come on. And, and the whole point of that scene was just to show how reckless they are. But I feel like if you're going to destroy a Voyager probe, there should be some sort of pomp with it. You know, there should be some sort of someone there crying, going, wait, no. Or like some like flash to like NASA on Earth or something, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> like in like, you know, 23rd or 4th century or whatever it was. I can't remember. To cross the, the streams a little bit, there would be a disturbance in the force. NASA would know. Yes. yes. <laughs> Indeed. Um, well, so cool. So, so Star Trek and Voyager. And so did you, um, you did a bachelor's in astronomy and then just continue on or was there something else? My bachelor's was in physics at the University of Houston. And then uh, I did not intend to go to grad school. I tutored uh, for a long time. And then moved to Fayetteville for reasons unrelated to the university. And one day I was sitting in my, uh, in my room looking up at a poster of astronomy and God, the universe, my own brain, something slapped me across the face and said, there are people studying this a mile and a half from your damn house. You need to go up there. And I'm like, but damn, I wasn't a very good student as an undergrad. Um, I was a physics major. I was very arrogant. I thought that I knew it already, and of course, that's not how you learn. And so I had, I, I, my transcript was not impressive. So in order to get into grad school, I retook some undergraduate uh, physics and astronomy classes uh, in order to make the case, hey, yes, my old resume or my old transcript from 10 or 15 years ago was not so good, but look what I can do now. I'm real. It's real now. I'm, I'm ready. And, uh, and, and they let me in. And so I got my PhD in physics, although my research is in astronomy because we don't have a PhD in astrophysics here. I wish we did. Although they're working on it. They nice. have, they now have an undergraduate physics degree with an astronomy, uh, concentration. Basically they've created enough astronomy classes now and astrophysics classes and space science classes uh, to produce a concentration. Excellent. 
Uh, so, so tell us a little about your area of research. So before I got here, uh, our research group found that uh, there is a link between the mass of the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy and how tightly wound the spiral arms of the galaxy are. Uh, we call that a pitch angle. The lower, the smaller the pitch angle, the more tightly wound they are. So a spiral with zero pitch is a circle. A spiral with 90 degree pitch is radial spokes. Most galaxies have a pitch angle of 20 degrees or so, but pretty much all of them are somewhere between five degrees and 40. And the more mass massive the black hole at the center, the smaller the pitch on average. There's a lot of scatter here, but it's nonetheless the, there is a correlation. And we don't think it's cause and effect. We think that because the black hole, while it is a monster in its own regime, its sphere of influence does not extend to the spiral arms. So we don't think it is the black hole itself that is pulling on the spiral arms. There is also a correlation between the mass of the bulge at the center of the galaxy hmm. and the tight, uh, the, the pitch angle of, of the spiral arms. So we think that's where the cause and effect is. The more massive the bulge, the more gas it is feeding the black hole, and therefore the more massive the black hole. And the more massive the bulge, the more the bulge is pulling on the spiral arms, making them more tightly wound. So we think it is the bulge that is causing both effects. That is the growth of the black hole and the, uh, the tightening of the spiral arms. Although uh, that's by no means certain. I mean, for example, first Hubble and now James Webb, we're seeing quasars that are fully, fully active, like fully grown, supermassive black holes, just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, which means they've not been growing slowly and steadily with time. Like whatever happened to make those black holes grow, and we still don't know where they came from, it happened quickly. And so it might have happened, it, ha it had to have happened very, very quickly. So if any hypothesis that we have about the formation of supermassive black holes has to take that into account. And the amount of time that your, your favorite model has to grow the black hole gets shorter and shorter with every generation of telescopes. Because the, every new generation of telescopes, we can look back farther in time, earlier and earlier, and we say already, oh my goodness, those black holes are already fully formed, or at least there are some examples of those that are already fully formed. So if it is the bulge that's feeding gas to the black hole to make it grow, it had to have happened very quickly. Hmm. Very cool stuff. I just was thinking about, the, as you say, within a few hundred million years, that's basically the lifespan of the dinosaurs, a black hole. <laughs> Could form. I mean, it's a short on the short end of that range, but that's sort of puts it in perspective. The 165 million years of the dinosaurs, the same amount of time that a black hole yeah. could form. Right, right. I mean, and not just any black hole, right? We're not talking about like a stellar mass black hole with like 50 solar masses. We're talking about super massive black holes with <laughs> millions or billions of solar masses. Yeah, yeah. Like, how can that happen in a couple hundred million years? Yeah, that's amazing. There's a lot of open hypotheses that have not been ruled out. One is that the very first stars, which have not been detected, this is purely purely hypothetical, pop, so-called population three stars that have practically nothing in them but hydrogen and helium, no heavy elements at all, would have, according to computer models, though they have not been detected, been able to grow hundreds of times the mass of our sun. Whereas today, the most massive stars are only 150 or maybe a little more than that. But the early ones might have been able to grow very quickly 
uh, or grow to hundreds of times the mass of our sun, which meant they would have blown up very quickly, formed black holes at the center, and if there were a bunch of them, they could merge or they could eat gas uh, or something like that. Another hypothesis is that they just form from direct collapse of hydrogen. Uh, essentially, um, there was so much hydrogen in such a small volume that um, an event horizon formed. Wow. Again, it was probably jump-started and, uh, and quickened by mergers, by eating other black holes, by eating stars, by eating gas, uh, yeah, and accretion of gas. But we really don't know, or it could be a whole bunch of little stellar mass black holes form, and then uh, the big ones kick the small ones out and then clump together, and then they kick the small ones out and clump together until they merge. That's a possibility, too. We don't know how they formed. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess we we might get some partial answers to some of this with James Webb, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, has, has anything already come of the, the most recent um, studies that were just released of the most... Um, distant galaxies that we really teased that apart yet or is it still too soon to really glean much from that i don't know i'm not familiar with that yet but if i understand correctly the most distant galaxies are no longer quasars and that's weird because quasars are you know the brightest candles in the universe they're these black holes that are eating gas that's spiraling in at near light speed and when you rub your hands together they get hot when you rub gas together, because it's spiraling into a black hole, it gets hot. But it's spiraling in at near light speed, so it gets so hot it glows. The brightest candle in the universe, that's a quasar. But James Webb is seeing um, galaxies that are even farther away than the most distant quasar, hmm. which is fascinating to me. And I don't quite understand how, how why that is. Why, why wouldn't it find... Or, Maybe it's just before quasars began. Maybe before black holes started eating gas. Hmm. That might yeah. answer how they uh, formed. We'll have to keep looking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, excuse my ignorance on this, but I, I hadn't heard of the direct collapse of hydrogen as a theory of, of forming those primordial black holes. That is fascinating. Yeah. I always assumed uh, it had to be something already like much denser, at least to the point of like fusion before something could collapse into a black hole. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking up now. Uh, it, it's um, there's a Wikipedia page called, let me see if this is right. Suspense is killing me. Yes. I want to make sure that I'm getting it right here. It's easy to get it wrong. Yeah, I don't understand the process, uh, but there is a thing called direct collapse black holes. Huh. Wow. But I want to make sure that's actually the same thing that I'm talking about because it's. In astrophysics, boy, there's a lot of terms that get made up, right, by scientists who discover a thing, they, they label it, and it kind of sounds like another concept, and it's not the same. Um, I mean, that would, that would just have to be like, just like an unimaginably enormous cloud of hydrogen to do that, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> like, we're talking like galactic size cloud of hydrogen to collapse into a black hole. One of the tricky things is you would think that kind of cloud would fragment, right? So that's a big uncertainty in all of this is does it fragment, does it not? And that's yeah. when all these different models of how you get these different massive black holes. Yeah. So you, right. you worked on that when, when you were in that realm, Lauren? It was at least relevant to some of the things I was thinking about, which were more of these population two stars, so ones after the first stars that then form. Um, so less huh. heavy metals than the sun, but more than zero. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I was also just uh, reading about something sort of in between, a so-called black hole star, 
square instead of having like a core like the core of the star is the black hole but the star itself yeah. is so big that nuclear fusion is still happening outside of the core and that's another oh. way to generate one of these incredibly massive black holes in a really short amount of time well so. I, but you're talking I think those about, might be the same hypothesis okay yeah i can but you're not talking about something in the current universe you're, you're talking about like primordial yeah. stars Correct. Once okay. we start getting things like uh, the heavier elements involved, the gas can cool, it can give off, and it, then it does start to fragment and collapse and form stars and clusters like we think of them now. So this is an early universe phenomenon. I don't know if you'd be able to get it as soon as you have a, a heavier element. Wow, that is crazy. As well. I've, I've never heard of that. That is super cool. Yeah. Um, huh. So does, this, does a star like that, like, eventually all collapse into the black hole or is it does okay yeah. i think it's the same sort of thing like the black hole is getting bigger the fusion sort of runs out and then the whole thing collapses in on itself oh very cool yeah. i will be uh, i'll be sure to bring that up the next time i have yeah. a class and you start asking about black holes which yeah. Every age group inevitably does, like regardless of whether they're like kindergartners or high school students. It's always like black holes and aliens in the edge of the universe. And to toilets in space is the other big one. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, yeah, I found it. It's, they also call them quasi stars. There's a Wikipedia page about them for those of us not as familiar with the scientific uh, <laughs> material necessary to understand it. <laughs> That's super cool. Yeah. Yeah, but we've never found one of these population three stars, and there's a lot of no. places people suggest to look for them, and James Webb would definitely be a contender for trying to find one. But hmm. so if is... they did form more like regular stars, then there would be lower mass population three stars, which in theory could be in the center of our galaxy. They wouldn't have died yet, but it's hard to look for things in the center of the galaxy. So, But that's also another promising place to look. So, I mean, I mean to, to identify such a star, we're, we're talking about a star with just extremely low metallicity, right? Basically just hydrogen and helium. Right, like zero metallicity. Zero yeah. metallicity, so not even like lithium, just like hydrogen, helium, done. Correct. Maybe some lithium, I guess, because of the Big Bang, but nothing else. Yeah. Huh. So are, are these population three stars, I mean, are these similar to like, uh, mid-sized black holes we, we postulate them to exist but we're not really sure whether they exist in the way that we think they do yes yes we don't have observational evidence for them but we something like a them. first star without a metal has to have existed otherwise mm. they wouldn't exist now so like it's we something like that has to have happened but what form yeah. of that book i think is still so is, is that not idea. odd that we haven't seen them yet I mean, if like if we're here, they must have been there, right? Yeah, but Probably. it was a really long time ago, so most of them would be gone if, and that's and we don't know. So, what mass they were? Would they all be gone? Would they not all be gone? There's still there are a lot of questions. Hmm. So. Yeah, like how far back are they? I mean, the farther away you look, the farther back in time you look, but. Will James Webb be able to see them? Are, are they recent enough that James Webb would be able to see them? I don't know. Hmm. I hope so. God, it would be great if James yeah. Webb could see a pop three star. Right. But like if they're on the smaller side of things, then they might not be bright enough to see. And then that's where you can start. Like <laughs> maybe it's not a big deal if we don't find them. It's, it's one of those fun spaces in astronomy, I think. <laughs> yeah. But I would love to find one. It would be great. <laughs> Yeah, that would be pretty cool. Huh. Fascinating. <laughs> My mind is just blown over here. I just went through the thought process of thinking, okay, James Webb, Margaret Burbridge has looked back 13.5 billion years, and we think the universe is 13.7 billion years. So we don't have much time to be looking back further, relatively speaking. Yes. <laughs> so relative. No, yeah. yes. But what if there's more? Like, what if we didn't get the estimate right for how far back there is to look? I don't know. I mean... It's not a lot of time to be finding something we're sure has to exist if we can find these things that we've, I guess we're finding things we've never seen before, so. Or just we it's just have, don't have the capabilities yet, right? Like like I was saying, sometimes maybe they're fainter than we think maybe that they tiny, are. Tiny, yeah. Or, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. um, 
we haven't even found everything that we know exists, must exist today. So <laughs> the quasar problem is much more dramatic. Like that one's really, that one's really becoming a problem of like, how do you build something that big in such a short amount of time? Um, it's, it's, it's a mystery. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that just seems like totally bizarre to me. I mean, especially because we just we don't see any mid-sized black holes. Like, if we did, it would be easier to postulate. Like, okay, a bunch of mid-sized black holes came together and formed a supermassive black hole. Um, but I don't even think there's one observation of a mid-sized black hole, right? That I don't know. I know there were like yeah. contenders. But I don't. I don't think there's yeah. been anything found over a hundred solar masses. Correct. Yeah, which is pretty wild. I mean, if we're talking about these like potentially like gigantic stars that had black holes in their centers or black holes that form from just like enormous clouds of pure hydrogen. Yeah. But I guess how would you find them, right? Like we find these quasars because they're so big that they then give off so much light that they're brighter than the galaxy that they're in. For something smaller, it's not like how would you, what would be the observational signature of that? It's probably drowned out by some sort of a galaxy. Hmm. And then in our galaxy, right? Like a black hole needs to be interacting with something to create light. So I don't know. It'd be cool to find it. I don't think it's outrageous that we haven't found one, but I'd like to find one. <laughs> The fun parts of astronomy to me are not like the edge cases on either side of size, but like the big gap in the middle, like the NASA <laughs> chart for black holes and dead like stars. It's like a question. They literally have a question mark on it. They know <laughs> there has to be something in there, but nobody knows what it is or where to find it. <laughs> yeah, I, I've seen that chart. I love that too. Uh, well, we are, we're about out of time, believe it or not. Um, but, but Dr. Shields, we always like to give the, the special guest the last words. And they can be any words. They can be words of inspiration. They can be um, more about your your own story or experience in the astrophysics community. Pretty much whatever you'd like. Uh, whenever I there's something cool going on in astronomy news, and I send a message out to my students, and I always end it with "Go outside and look up." Nice. That that is a great ending line, and I. I you kind of stole my line because that's what I usually tell people at the end of the show. So I, I don't know how I'm going to end. It. I don't know how I'm going to end it in a couple of minutes here. Something's going to come out of my mouth, and maybe it'll be the same thing, or maybe I'll come up with something else. Um, but anyways, uh, thank you for that. Uh, right on the mark. Um, really appreciate all your time um, this evening to be on the Astro Show. Thank you so much for that. And wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, our uh, our operations director uh, Maggie will uh, reach out to you with a thank you gift. Um, so again, um, really appreciate your time. And uh, also, uh, Lauren, Valerie, your two co-stars, uh, couldn't have the show without you. So thank you so much for all of your insights, inspiration, expertise, and um, your willingness to be a part of the Astro Show. It's, uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, thanks to all of you uh, out there watching the Astro Show. Uh, we're glad you could join us. And for all of you eventually who watch this recording, uh, we hope you like it. And we hope you join us for a live show sometime soon. Uh, thanks to all the other folks behind the scenes. Uh, Maggie, our operations director, the Wyoming Stargazing Board of Directors, all of our supporters. And again, all of you out there, uh, until we see you again, uh, be well. And uh, I've got nothing better to say than uh, don't forget to look up. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.